So as a troll on Twitter, yeah, in the best sense of the word, what do you make uh, of cancel culture? Of I think it's Maoism. It's, I mean, the uh, corporate America has done a far better job of implementing Maoism than the Communist Party ever could. You had this meeting not that long ago from, I think it was Northwestern University Law School, where everyone on the call got up and said that they were racist. I mean, this is something that legally you should be very averse to saying, even if it were true. Uh, and it's a, this kind of concept of getting up and confessing your sins before the collective is something completely. Uh, uh, oh, they sorry, they admitted this of themselves. Yeah, they were like because they're saying because they're white, they're inherently racist. So my name's John. I'm a racist. My name's this. I'm a racist. It was. It was. Uh, you hear it and you're like, okay, this is Looney Tunes. So you're saying that? Wow, that's that, that's so much. You took a step further. So you're saying there's like a a deep underlying force besides cancel culture. It's not just some kind of mob. Oh, it's not a mob at all. It's a... Uh, it's a systemic organized movement uh, being used for very nefarious purposes and to dominate you know, an entire nation. How do we fight it? Because I sense it inside. You know, I used to defend academia um, more because um, I, I still do to some extent. It's a nuanced discussion because you know, uh, like folks like Jordan Peterson and a lot of people that kind of attack academia, they refer, they really are talking about gender studies in certain departments. And me from MIT, you know, it's the University of Science and Engineering and the, the faculty there really don't think about these issues or haven't traditionally thought about it. It's beginning to even infiltrate there. It's the, you know, it's, it's starting to infiltrate engineering and sciences outside of biology. Yeah. Like, let's put biology with the gender studies. Like, I'm talking about sciences that really don't have anything to do with gender. Uh, it's starting to infiltrate. Um, and it, it worries me. I don't know exactly why. Like, I don't know exactly what the negative effect there would be, except it feels like it's anti intellectual. Oh, yes, like, of course. And I'm not sure what to, because uh, on the surface, it feels like a path towards progress. At first, when you when I'm like zoomed out, you know, just like like squinting my eyes, the, you know, not even in detail looking at things. But when I actually join the conversation to like listen in, the conversation on quote unquote diversity, it quickly makes me realize that there's no interest in, um, in making a better world. No, no, it's about domination. It's it's about, about getting, cost. yeah. It's a way for, if you are a lowest status white person, using anti-racism is the only mechanism you will have to feel superior to another human being. So it's very useful for them. Um, in terms of fighting it, uh, one of my suggestions has been to seize all university endowments, which are the crystallization of privilege, and distribute that money as reparations. So be very effective by turning two populations against each other and strongly diminishing the university's uh, intellectual hegemony. Uh, the universities are absolutely the real villains in the picture. Thankfully, they're also the least prepared to be aggressed upon. Uh, and after the government and the corporate press, they are the last leg of the stool and they don't know what's coming and it's gonna get ugly and I cannot wait. So this is where you and I disagree. Well, we, yeah, we disagree in the sense that you want to dismantle broken institutions. I don't think they're broken. The I powerful. think they're working like by design. I think for over a hundred years, they have been talking about bringing the next generation of American leaders, which is code for promulgating an ideology based on egalitarian principles and world domination. Let me try to express my lived experience. Okay, too. sure. Okay. My experience at MIT is that there's a bunch of administrators that are the bureaucracy. Sure. That I can I can say this is the nice thing about having a podcast. I don't give a damn. Is they're pretty useless. In fact, yes. they get in the way. But there's faculty, there's professors that are incredible. They're incredible human beings. That all they do all day. They're too busy, but for the most part, what they do all day is just like continually pursue different little trajectories of curiosities in the in the various avenues of science that they work on. And as a side effect of that, they mentor 
a group of students, sometimes a large group of students, and also teach courses. And they're constantly sharing their passion with others. And my experience is it's just a bunch of people who are curious about engineering and math and science, chemistry, artificial intelligence, computer science, what I'm most familiar with. And there's never this feeling of MIT being broken somehow, like this kind of t feeling, like if I talk to you just now, or like Eric Weinstein, there's a feeling like sh stuff is on fire, right? There's something deeply broken. So. Uh, but when I'm in, in the system, uh, especially before the COVID, before this kind of tension, everything was great. There was no discussion of even diversity, all that kind of stuff. The, the toxic stuff that we might be talking about right now, none of that was happening. It was a bunch of people just in love with uh, cool ideas, exploring ideas, being curious and learning and all that kind of stuff. So I don't, my, my sense of academia was this is the place where kids in their 20s, 30s and 40s can continue the playground of science, can, having fun. It's, if you destroy academia, if you destroy universities, like you're suggesting kind of lessening their power, you take away the playground from these kids to 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 play. It's it, gonna be hard for you to tell me that I'm anti-playground. Yeah, well, I guess I'm saying you're anti certain kinds of playgrounds, which is- Yeah, the ones that have the broken glass on the floor. Yeah, I am against those kinds of playgrounds. No, no, you're, 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 Yes. No. Nope. See. Yes. <laughs> then you see. Then you listen. <laughs> no. You. No. You wait. Yeah. I. I. I would say you're being the watchful mother who, the one kid who hurt themselves in the glass. One kid. It's an entire gen. It's generation after generation. I'm not a watchful mother. I'm the guy with the flamethrower. No. I. I. I understand that. But you're using the one kid who was always kind of like weird. Um, That's AKA us. Gender studies department. <laughs> okay. Uh, that that hurt themselves on the glass as opposed to the people who are like obviously having fun in the playground and not uh, playing by the glass, the broken glass. And they're just, I mean, to me, some of the best innovations in science happen in universities. Okay. Like you can't forget that universities don't have this liberal, like politics like literally in every conversation until this year, until this, this year, there's something happening, but, uh, every conversation I've ever had had nothing to do with politics. We never, Trump never came up, none of that ever come up, nothing. Like all this kind of idea that there's liberal, all that, but that that's in the humanities. That, yeah, but do you think MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology might be a little bit of an outlier? Yeah, that probably is, yeah. But I, I don't, I honestly don't think when people criticize academia, they're looking at, the, uh, they're in fact also picking the outliers which is they're picking some of the quote unquote strongest gender studies departments. This is nonsensical. When I was at Bucknell, yeah. I was a college student, we had to take, uh, you know, we had a bunch of electives and I want to take a class on individual, American individualism. One of the texts of the five that we had to read was Birth of a Nation, the movie about the Klan. Yeah. So there's no department where these people are not thoroughgoing hardcore ideologues. Uh, no, this that, is not a gender- humanities. That's a humanity. Fine, all the humanities, it's not just gender studies. Okay, fine, I, I can give you- History, English. Yes. But... All of them, every university, as you know, yeah. has it mandatory in the curriculum, they have to take a bunch of these propaganda classes. I look forward to YouTube comments because you're being more eloquent and you're speaking to the thing that a lot of people agree with, and I'm being my usual slow self, and people are going to say not very nice things about me. Don't say Fine. anything not nice about Lex, Okay, please. Let me try to just- Just shoot up a school. That would be preferable. There he goes again. Only the teachers. Go to the darkest possible place. That's sunshine, Thank baby, you. schools. That's where everyone goes to be happy, playgrounds. There he goes, dark ear. <laughs> just dives right in like a, just go dark and then just so comes back up to the surface. <laughs> I don't have to feel this way anymore. It's just one day. Um, <laughs> you're probably a figment of my imagination. I'm not even having this podcast. <laughs> well, this after just... 18 Red Bulls, I'm surprised you could see anything. <laughs> this is like Fight Club. Red Bull gives you life. delirium. Yeah. Uh, Fight Club. <laughs> I got into it at, at Norton yesterday on the Twitter. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Is he uh, like the rest of the celebrities? Yeah, he's like, oh, this is an existential threat to America. Trump's a fascist. He's delegitimizing the Oval Office. I said, what an odd endorsement of Trump. Well, you should have went with Bat Pitt. He might have a different opinion. But that's true. The Fight Club reference. Okay. Uh, This conversation is over. (laughs) It's interesting. I'd like to draw a line between science and engineering and science not including like the biological aspect, the the parts of biology that touch and humanities and biology. Like I feel because uh, humanities, if you just look at the percentage of universities, it's still a, a minority percentage. And I would actually draw a different, I think they serve very different purposes. Sure. And that's actually a broken part about universities about like why, why is some of the best research in the world done at universities? That doesn't, yeah. like there might be a different, like MIT, it feels weird that a faculty. Yeah, these are conceptually different things. Like yeah. we do research and we teach. Why is this the same? Yeah, diagram? it feels weird. But yeah. that's just. But but I'm also I'm coming to like the defense of the engineers that never talk about. I'm not like like my mind isn't. I'm not like deluded or something where I'm I'm not seeing the the house on fire. I'm just saying I am seeing the house because I also lived in Harvard Square. I'm seeing Harvard, but. In, when you see the tanks coming, they're coming, Lex. They're it's co- gonna be so beautiful. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll be like the, the American Beauty, the plastic bag. I just won't be able to stop crying because it'll be so beautiful. Yeah, the tanks. I could. I can already. I can already see it. But the but the engineering departments, where like I believe that the Elon Musks of the world, that the the like the innovation that will make a better world is happening, and like let's not burn that down. Cause that has nothing to do with any, like they're all like sitting quietly in the, <laughs> while like, uh, while the the humanities and all these kind of diversity programs, they're, they're not having any of these discussions. Listen, my yeah. Soviet brother, you both know, we both know that ice water runs in our veins. So if you're calling for mercy, that is not how I'm wired, yeah. but I'm not closing the door. Yeah. I'm actually realizing now, so for, for people listening to this, I'll probably prepend this and saying that I'm even, slower than usual, I didn't sleep last night, but I feel I'm actually realizing just how slow I am and how much preparation I need to do. And if I would like to defend aspects of academia, I better come prepared. I don't think you need to defend them. I think I'm I'm granting you your premise freely. No, you might be. Okay. I don't think the the world is. I but think actually I, you I, just I, defeat your own argument because it is not at all have to be the way that a phenomenal research institution like MIT, which no one disputes, has to also be an educational establishment. These two things are not at all uh, necessarily interconnected. But then you have to offer a way to separate them. Correct. But like, I'm, I'm not a big fan, everybody's different, but I'm not a fan of criticizing institutions without offering sure. a way to change. And especially when I'm like, have ability to change, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to offer a path like what if to, they, they were in students? They were all mentor, like a uh, like men, like um, what's the opposite of a mentor? Mentee, protege. What's the term when you like when, when students? you work at a place like interns? Not an intern, it's not the word I'm thinking of. But anyway, like basically they're working there instead of going to college there. It's possible, but it's, it's going against tradition, and so you have to build new institutions and. Uh, uh, and then, can't have these engineers building new things. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> these research engineers. What are they going to be building things? <laughs> Well, the, one of the things, because you're kind of, you know- a Apprentice, that's the word I was looking at. Apprentice. That's Which is the, ironic, we're talking about Trump and like, we couldn't think of the word apprentice. Uh, very, yeah, well done. We should both be you're fired. fired. <laughs> yeah, there you go. These Russian Jews, so quick with their wit. Okay, uh, but the, the the thing is, you're a fan of freedom. I am. <laughs> and there is there is uh, intellectual freedom. People, th- this is what I was trying to articulate. I'm failing to articulate, but there truly is- complete intellectual freedom within universities on topics of science and engineering. I believe you, I agree with you. I don't think it's gonna take much persuasion, but I'll give you an example. When that, uh, I'm I'm sure you know more details about this than I do. When that uh, scientist engineered that probe to land on that comet and the articles were written because this Hawaiian shirt he was wearing had like pinup girls on it, which I think his female student sewed for him or something, or his ex-girlfriend. And he had to apologize. This is what Rand was talking about. Yeah. That the great accomplishments of men have to say I'm sorry to the lowest, most despicable, disgusting people. Yeah, I don't know. 
you know, let me bring this case up because I think about this. Uh, this might not mean much to you, but it means a lot to a certain aspect of the computer science community. There's a guy named Richard Stallman. I don't know if you, you know who that is. No. He's the founder of the Free Software Foundation. He's like a big Linux. He's one of the key people in the okay. history of computer science, one of those open source people, right? But he is like, I believe he's the, one of the hardcore ones, which is like so, all software should be free. Okay. Okay, so it's very interesting personality, very key pe person in the GNU, just like Linus Torvald, key person. So, but he also kind of speaks his mind. Okay. And on a certain chain of conversations at MIT that was leaked to the New York Times, then was published, led him to be fired or pushed out of MIT recently, maybe a year ago. And I, it always sat weird with me. So what happened is um, there's a few undergraduate students that called Marvin Minsky. I'm not sure if you're familiar who that I, is. I've heard the name. He's one of the seminal people in artificial intelligence. They they said that they called him a rapist because uh, he met with Jeffrey Epstein and Jeffrey Epstein solicited uh, to, these are the best facts known to me that I'm aware of. That's what was stated on the chain. Is he solicited a 17, but it might have been an 18 year old girl to come up to Marvin Minsky and ask him if he wanted to have sex with her. So he, Jeffrey Epstein told the girl. Yeah. She came up to Marvin Minsky, who was at that time is I think seven years old, and his wife was there too, Marvin Minsky's wife, and he said no or like you know, awkwardly yeah, saying, no, thank you. Yeah. no thanks. And th th that was stated in the email thread as Marvin participating in uh, sexual assault and rape of this uh, unwilling sexual assault, and they, it was called rape uh, of this person, right? Of this woman that propositioned him. And then Richard Stallman, who's the, he's kind of known for this. He's very, he's, <laughs> you, you make fun of me being a robot, but he's kind of like a debugger. He's like, well, that sentence is not, what you said is not correct. So he like corrected the person, uh, basically made it seem like the, the use of the word rape is not correct because that's not the definition of rape. Yeah. And then he was attacked for saying, Oh, now you're playing with definitions of rape. Rape is rape, is the answer, right? And then that was leaked in him defending. So the way it was leaked, it was re reported as him defending um, rape. That's the way it was reported. And he was pushed out and he didn't really give a damn. It's, he doesn't seem to make a big deal out of it. He but just left. He made an example of him. They made an example. And that. And then everyone was afraid to defend him. So like, there's a bunch of faculty. One Dude, fa you're from the Soviet Union. Doesn't this hit close to home for you? I don't know what to think of it. It hits close to home, but it was basically, at least at MIT. Now, MIT is such a light place with this. It's not common at MIT, but it was like 18, 19 year old kids, undergraduate kids with this kind of fire in them. There's just very few of them, but they're the ones that raise all this kind of fuss. And the entirety of the administration, all the faculty are afraid to stand up to them. It's so interesting to me. Like, I, I don't know if I should be afraid of that. You don't think you should be afraid so, that so Richard, someone who's trying to be specific when it comes to charges of violent assault is looking for that clarity, can get their life, uh, other search let, let, let me give you more context. There's a little bit more context to Richard Stallman, which is- He was also a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> no. I left out that part, he liked no, raping people. But he's had a history through his life uh, of, you know, every once in a while wearing the Hawaiian shirt with, like he would make, he's a fat, uh, sorry, but he's a fat, unattractive. He like what Trump referred to the the yeah, yeah, the, the, the guy, hacker, guy in the basement in, in yeah. the basement. That's Richard. Okay, okay I love you know is, is, is you know he is what he is. People you know people he like he would eat his own. Uh, he would pick skin from his feet in, in lectures and just eat it. No. Okay. Yeah. This video is him doing that. So he but, must. I'm not joking. He must really be behind the spectrum then. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Up to, yeah. And oh, so, and you know uh, he I think. 
this uh, and his office, he, he uh, door. He wrote something like, uh, 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 like hacker uh, plus uh, plus lover of ladies or something like that. Like something kind of yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so unprofessional. It, yeah, unprofessional and and a little creepy. Yeah like yeah. No, creepy. that's fair. That is, yeah. So he was so, also. So they were looking for an excuse to get rid of him. It sounds like. Uh, no, he was just a. Who's they? The administration. Yeah, probably, probably. A lot of times what people don't realize, and this will be my defense of cancel culture, a lot of times when someone gets fired over something like this, yeah. this isn't why. This is just giving them cover to get rid of them without getting a lawsuit. Yeah, but it's still, I, so I think, I guess what I'm trying to communicate is he was a little weird and creepy and he may, may not be the, the best for the community, but that's not necessarily the message it sent to the rest of the community. The message is sent to the rest of the community that being clear about words or the usage of the word rape is uh, like, you should call everything rape. That's 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 basically the message it was sent. Or you and should call what we say rape, rape. It's about submission. Yeah. I think I'm. you'd be very happy to know that there's a lot of people, and she's very crucified with this, like Betsy DeVos, the president of the Department of Education, who are aware of this. They are aware that this completely contradicts due process. Uh, they're aware of how a rape accusation is something not to be taken seriously, but because it's not to be taken seriously, it has to be also taken seriously in other context that, you know, once that word is around a male, this can ruin his entire life. Um, and yeah, that's, that, that's the sticky thing of the word. Like I, like I think about this a lot that, um, like how would I defend it if somebody, like I've I've never, I can honestly say I've never done anything close to creepy in my life, like, uh, with, like with women. But you wouldn't know it if you had, right? That's the thing, a lot of these creepy guys don't think they're creepy. They think they're being cute. Yeah, but I'm just telling you even like, or, or, uh, fine, let's say, right, let's say I'm not aware of it. But the point that I am aware of is that somebody could just completely make something up. Correct, yeah, 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 okay. And like, how, what, a, what would I- supposed to do? No, he denied the charges. There's an article around everything you did, supposedly, and it goes, uh, Mr. Friedman denied the charges, yeah. But what creeps me out? That happened, can I interrupt? There yeah, was, sure. Zora Neale Hurston is one of my favorite writers. She's from the Harlem Renaissance. Um, she wrote Their Eyes Are Watching God, and a couple of other books. She was just an amazing, amazing figure. Her biography is called um, Wrapped in Rainbows. It's just a masterpiece. I, like, I think I read it one day. Can't recommend her enough. Fascinating, fascinating woman. During the 30s, I think it was, or 1940, she was out of the country. She was accused of molesting a teenage boy. She wasn't in America. This could be proven. So there's, it's absolutely false, not even a question. She was indicted and she wanted to kill herself. Because she's like, people are going to see these things and they're going to think maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe it's voluntary. What they're just going to, and, and you could understand why she'd be suicidal over this. So yeah, this is, this is something that's been going on for a long time. And, and, and the fact that it's becoming, I do agree, it's important. I know a lot of women who have been sexually assaulted more than I, I'm happy that I know. And if I know that many, that means there's more. So I, I don't, I think it's, it's a good idea that they feel seen, that they don't feel wounded, they don't feel damaged, that they can talk to their friends. And yeah. I'm like, man, this sucks, this happened to you. And, and I don't think you're a slut. I don't think you're asking for it. I think you feel violated, I think it's gross. Talk to me, like, I, I do think that that's important. And I also think it's important though, like when things get kind of in a frenzy, that a lot of people are like, yeah, I also had something happen. And very quickly, the line between he grabbed my boob and he violently raped me. I don't think these two things are, are the same at all. I think they're both sexual assault, but in terms of what someone can deal with the next day, the next month, 10 years later, I, I, I don't think they're similar scenarios. Yeah. I had Juanita Broderick on my show and hearing her talk about you know her alleged rape by Bill Clinton was very disturbing for me, very disturbing to hear because it was like half an hour. So, you know, we think of these things and think, okay, hold her down, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then it's done. Half an hour when, so just even someone physically holding you down for ha half an hour. Yeah. Like not even a sexual assault. Yeah. Like that's traumatic. Yeah. You think, am I gonna, your brain's gonna think, am I gonna die? When I zoom out, I think the ultimately this is gonna lead to a better world. Like empowering women to speak to the, those kinds of experiences, the benefit of it outweighs the, uh, the, the issue is whenever people are given a weapon, 
some are going to use it yeah. in nefarious ways. And that's the lesson of history. Males, when males, females, whites, blacks, children, adults, when people are given a mechanism to execute power over others, some are gonna use it. Can I ask you for a therapy thing? Um, sure. On, tr on trolling, in a sense. Because uh, I mentioned somebody making up something about me. I feel because I wear my heart on my sleeve, I'm not good with these attacks. Like I've been attacked recently, just being called a fraud and all that kind of stuff. Just light stuff. Like I haven't, you know, it was like, it hurt. Okay, well, let me help you. Maybe it's because I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. Here's why. In New York, a lot of times you'll be walking with your friend and a homeless person will come up to you and start yelling things at you. Your reaction isn't in those circumstances let me hear this out. Your reaction is physical safety and getting away. Now, it's not impossible that that homeless person is actually saying the truth. This happened to my a friend of mine. She, This guy wasn't homeless. Um, and he's walking down the street on Smith Street and he's just talking out loud. And it goes, why they call them hipsters? What are they hip to? And she chuckles yeah. and it goes, what are you laughing at, fatso? You start something, I'll finish it. Yeah. And she, she just couldn't move. Yeah. And it's like, is my wow. weight a problem? Because that's the first thing he went to. Yeah. And there's, I don't know that I have any advice, but when you hear something like this, this is, I think you need to be better in terms of boundaries. I think you should not perceive this as a fellow human, but as a crazy homeless person. Because if this fellow human, if I thought that you were a fraud in some context, that's a very weird word to use because well, fraudulent podcaster, <laughs> these are real mics. But if I well, thought, scientist or human, sure. But I would ask myself: Is this person in a position to make this judgment, or are they backing it up? Are they saying, "Here, your conclusions were wrong. Here's some mistakes in your data, and you can engage with them in ideas." But whenever someone uses a word to entirely dismiss your life without having the knowledge of your life, you do not have to take that seriously. I, I appreciate that kind of idea, but the. Some things aren't about data. Like, you know, I, I, I see myself as a fraud often and it's uh, it's more psychology of it. Um, If I can reduce something to reason, I can probably be fine. My worry is the same as the worry of uh, like teenage girls that get bullied online. It's like when I'm being open and fragile on the internet, it, it affects me in a way where I can't, the, the reason doesn't help. So it, it helps me. You but, don't block people enough. I'm very heavy with the blocking. No, I, I so yeah, I, I, I very block, heavy. I block. I, it's Any helped a lot. Aggressive banality. I block immediately. I also think time is going to help. I don't think you're like you didn't grow, grow up wanting to be a podcaster, right? That wasn't your aspiration. So in some sense, you are going to feel like a fraud because you're like, what? I don't have any training for this. I have training for a scientist. I can talk to you about artificial intelligence for literally hours. But in terms of this, like, oh, what am I doing? I'm kind of so when they call you a fake, it's like, yeah, you're kind of right because like I I did kind of stumble into this. Yeah, and this is not my pedigree. So I think that kind of probably speaks to you on some level. Well, but they're they're attacking not the podcasting oh. thing, but more like the same. They, people call Elon Musk a fraud too, which okay. that that's the way I rationalize it. Like, well, if they're calling him a fraud, and they're calling me a fraud, that like even if you have rockets that go into like if you successfully have rockets uh, landing back on Earth, yeah. reusable rockets, you're still being called a fraud. Then it's okay. Not necessarily. It could be that he's not a fraud. You really are. <laughs> that's, but it's I, not resonating with you because your brain knows the logic, so you can't right, yourself. That's, but, uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know this whole trolling thing. You seem to be much better at seeing it as a game. You know why? Because you are under the delusion that every human being is capable of intelligent, reasoned decision. Still think I'm right. And I perceive them as literally animals. So when a dog starts <laughs> barking, all it's saying is that the dog is agitated and this is not going to change my life one iota other than crossing the street, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna prove you wrong one day. <laughs> if you're gonna kill yourself because they're gonna drive you to sure. it. No. The first shoot up a school. <laughs> but if I don't, I'll prove you wrong. Okay. I'll bring the data. And they'd be like, you're right, Lex. I have the receipts. I have the receipts.